Glad you're here and hope you will find here what you are seeking. As you know, we are a community of individuals holding many different beliefs, coming from many different places, and each progressing on our own journeys of life and faith. We join together in our commitment to care for humanity and in our effort to shape a better, healthier, more accepting, more inclusive, more hopeful world. We promise that we will accept and encourage all those persons of goodwill who gather here, recognizing that we all continue to grow and learn throughout our lifetimes. We especially welcome and stand with LGBTQ persons, even as we seek to welcome all persons of every age, ability, status, color, and ethnicity. We strive to make our community a place of peace and acceptance, love and nurture, even as we challenge ourselves and others to live more faithfully according to the values of Unitarian Universalism. Can you all understand me well enough with the microphone? Okay. We are encouraging people to stay masked during the service. I know most of you, if not all of you, have received the, uh, the vaccines and uh, encourage anyone who's able to get it to get it, of course. I'm modeling some new masks that we got, which are actually N95s. And uh, there are a few out in the foyer, and Mary's gonna keep a stock um, as we progress. Um, but as long as you can hear me, I'm gonna try and keep this on. Though understand, I don't like it any more than the rest of you, but I, I'm trying to model good mask behavior. So. Anyway, it's really good to see all of you. We're still having tech problems, so if you talk to anyone who's asking about the Zoom or, or having videos available, we hope to restore that soon, but we have not yet accomplished it. When AT&T upgraded us, um, it cut off our ability to, uh, to do the things that we had started to do with the Zoom, and, uh, and we have some limitations. We really could use another camera, at least as good as that one, but uh, we don't have it, so, so we're currently using that one. We're trying to record the service, and we'll try and get it up on YouTube. Um, we, we just need someone to stitch the two pieces together and, and to put it up, so we're looking to to get that to happen, but uh, we've had a glitch there too. But anyway, we're working on it. Welcome, good to see you, and, uh, and June has, has our prelude. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dwayne Milnes, and I'm worship associate today. And if anybody can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> our opening words this morning are number 443 in our large hymnal. We arrive out of many singular rooms, walking over the branching streets, 
We come to be assured that brothers and sisters surround us to restore their images on our eyes. We enlarge our voices in common speaking and singing. We try again that solitude found in the midst of those who with us seek their hidden reckonings. Our eyes reclaim the remembered faces, their voices stir the surrounding air. The warmth of their hands assures us and the gladness of our spoken names. This is the reason of cities, of homes, of assemblies, and the houses of worship. It is good to be with one another. Now our chalice lighting this morning. Our chalice lighting words are in your order of service. Let's read those together. We light our chalice in solidarity with Unitarian Universalists around the country and around the world. We join in our hope that this movement will continue to offer a beacon of light as long as time shall last. Opening hymn this morning is Rank by Rank, and the words are in the insert in your program. And afterwards, greet one another.
Let's read our words of affirmation together. And since we all look like both children and adults, why don't we read both parts? We believe in love. Love is the only doctrine of this church. We believe in truth. The quest for truth is our sacrament. We believe in helping others, and service is our prayer. We believe in the sacredness of life, to dwell together in peace, seek knowledge and freedom, serve humanity and fellowship, and cherish the earth and its creatures. This do we covenant, each with the other. And the story for all ages is me. <laughs> and the story this morning is called, What Do You Do With an Idea? I sort of like the, uh, the part at the beginning that says, always remember a single idea can change everything. Signed, Dad. One day, I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered, what do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. <laughs> it seemed kind of strange and fragile. It looked like a small egg. I didn't know what to do with it. So I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me, but it followed me. <laughs> I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit, I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. <laughs> it grew bigger, and we became friends. I showed it to other people even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly. And many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. And they said it was a waste of time. And that it would never become anything. And at first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do, and it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food, I worked with it, I played with it. Most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything. It encouraged me to think big, and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands, because it said, it is good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Then one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. 
It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. Thank you. 
finishing up the demolition pieces and then you know, all that. So, lots of lots of joy for me. We give thanks for the blessing of being able to come together. We are glad that we can see each other's faces, mostly, and hear each other's words fairly well, and that we can see each other's eyes and connect. And remember that we create the community that is this church we are thankful for each member, those who are able to come these days and those who are still staying away for one reason or another. We send our good energy to those who are struggling to get home from Afghanistan and who are worried about loved ones there. We send our good energy to all those who have been displaced and unhomed by the fires in recent days. We send our hopes that the fires will soon burn out and people will be able to return to their homes or to build new homes if necessary. We send our thoughts to all those who are struggling, those who are reaching the end of life and need our support, our contact, those whose loved ones are at that point. We give thanks that we're able to listen to each other and to share our support if not the hands that we might in other times be able to offer at least our listening ears. We give thanks for this church and the community that fills it with so much life. We give thanks for each other this day. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing Spirit of Life. The words, as usual, are in the program.
Our responsive reading this morning is in your order of service. If recognizing the interdependence of all life, we strive to build community, the strength we gather will be our salvation. You are black and I am white. It will not matter. If you are female and I am male. It will not matter. If you are older and I am younger. It will not matter. If you are progressive and I am conservative. It will not matter. If you are straight and I am gay. It will not matter. If you are Christian and I am Jewish. It will not matter. If we join spirits as brothers and sisters, the pain of our aloneness will be loosened, lessened, and that does matter. In this spirit, we build community and move toward restoration. Thank you, Duane. At this time in our service, we generally share our gifts and offerings. We are not passing the plate for the foreseeable future, but there is a plate there if anyone would like to um, share a gift or offering for the work of this church or put in a pledge payment. In any, way, in any case, we take this time to be aware of the needs that we share. And I invite June to share the offertory. Wonderful, June. Thank you. 
And I didn't mention uh, it earlier, and she didn't come to light a candle, but uh, she's starting her senior year tomorrow, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I think the U is ready to send her off after a few more classes. So, anyway, we're glad to have you. I want to talk today about the path ahead for Unitarian Universalism. This is a two-part sermon, so if you don't get what you are hoping for or want this week, then perhaps you'll find it next week. Or not. <laughs> the path ahead for Unitarian Universalism is a bit unclear at the moment. In fact, though there has been an effort over many years to work at being anti-racist, anti-oppressive, and multicultural, there's been only limited success in those efforts. More recently, this effort seems to have turned into a program to silence and disempower whites, and particularly straight white males. This has resulted in some progress in increasing the number of persons of color who populate UU ministry, but it is unclear how it has affected the movement overall. I've been reading a few books essentially banned by UU leaders, and I have become concerned about some of the changes that may be coming. Attacks on the use of logic, on academia and intellectualism, seem entirely counter to the movement that I chose to join some 30 years ago. While well, master's level seminary training of ministers has been the standard for the last century or so, the costs, years of study required, and availability of such training for persons of color has been raised as a matter requiring an alternate path. I'm glad to be preparing for retirement because I don't know if I will recognize this movement in a few years. That some kind of revival has been needed and that there needs to be more outreach to persons of color as well as to LGBTQIA persons, I would heartily agree. That whites need to be pushed out or made to atone for history I'm not so certain about. As an old, straight, white male, I think I might be beginning to take some of this personally. The report of the UUA Commission on Institutional Change made some pretty strong recommendations to Unitarian Universalism when it came out in 2020. The commission focused almost entirely on matters of race and inclusion in the movement, the UUA, and in our congregations. The process the commission used was very inviting to persons of color in our movement, but not as welcoming to input from the white members who form the vast majority of our membership. The commission's intent was to obtain stories from persons who had been harmed or excluded because of their color. And they obtained many stories from both religious professionals and members who are persons of color. The process focusing on persons of color was the only way the commission felt it could obtain adequate information from persons of color. And in that regard, it was likely correct. The overall solution recommended by the commission is to center the experience of BIPOC persons, black, indigenous, and other persons of color. Whether that is the only way for Unitarian Universalism to make progress in regard to fully including and treating persons of color justly and with equality, I'm not convinced. There were a few jumps in logic required to get to that position that have not been well supported in the Commission's work or report. There is, however, 
ample evidence that we had not attracted very many persons of color through previous efforts over the prior half century. Some of the assumptions made in the work of the commission centered around the belief that our movement, along with our society generally, is dominated by the beliefs and practices now labeled white supremacy. If that is true, the work of the commission and its recommendations may indeed be the only possible corrective, and the effort to decenter the beliefs and practices of whites may be necessary. But that is where I'm not yet fully convinced. Thousands of Unitarian Universalists have worked throughout the decades I have been in this movement to welcome, include, and respect persons of color as they enter and engage with our congregations. That there have also been incidents in many congregations that were less welcoming and respectful, I do not doubt. The larger trend I have observed in the congregations I have served and in larger meetings of the movement has been respectful and inclusive. I've seen many times when persons of color received far more attention and respect than whites. My observations are only my own, but I have seen enough efforts to welcome persons of color that I cannot fully affirm the indictment made by the Commission on Institutional Change of the widespread impact of white supremacy in our movement. That we need to do more, I do not disagree. But the solution offered, and in some cases practiced recently, does seem draconian. In rereading the commission report, I find myself wondering what the end goal of the actions recommended is. Decentering the white experience and replacing it with the experience of persons of color seems to unbalance this movement away from those who have supported and sustained it. What will happen to Unitarian Universalism if all the white ministers, religious educators, and members are decentered out of leadership positions? Is the goal to become a movement of, for, and only really open to persons of color? The separate structures within the blue Black Lives UU movement, to which white persons are not welcomed, seem to suggest that that is at least a possibility. If the current mostly white leadership is replaced by persons of color, will whites be welcomed to participate? What will it really mean to center the experiences of persons of color? At the current point, there seems some openness to include at least white allies, but it is unclear what that will mean in the future. Will the future of UU, UUism be open to white financial support, but not leadership or other input? Where does this path really lead? I'm sure I'm now liable to censure from leadership for challenging the current process, and yes, I realize it will be quite a while before this recentering will be complete, but where are we going? Please understand that I in no way wish to advocate for keeping UUism a movement for whites only. I do, however, wish to advocate for a movement that is open to and accepting of all persons, even if they are white. I want to be in a movement that includes persons of all shades of skin, all levels of ability, all expressions of gender, and many religious, spiritual, philosophical, and theological perspectives. I want to be an inclus in an inclusive movement, one that even welcomes old pale faces like me. In the aftermath of some racially-based conflict five years ago, the UU Board of Trustees promised and raised $5.3 million for, for Blue, Black Lives UU. This was largely seen as reparations for an unpaid pledge to Black UUs 50 years ago and a good faith effort to support the work of Black UUs. 
in a fiscal downturn not unlike that which resulted in the previous default, I was not convinced that this was a good decision. I also had and have reservations about setting up an, in, an almost entirely separate movement from Unitarian Universalism. I would rather have seen us work harder to listen to and make room for persons of color in the mainstream of UUism. But those efforts admittedly had not succeeded all that well in the last half century. I'm not convinced that the current indictment of whites as supporting white supremacy in Unitarian Universalism is at all fair to the thousands of white UUs who have worked to make this movement welcoming to all persons of goodwill without regard to color, ability, or gender expression. I do not doubt that there have been manifestations of racism, heterosexism, and ableism, but I do not believe that those have been the norm in the last three decades. I've been deeply disappointed in the resurgence of societal racism and sexism under Trump, but I have seen enough progress in my lifetime that I am not ready to accept that either our society or our church are beyond saving. In many ways, I am far more concerned about the failure of our society to deal with the closely linked matter of climate degradation. Persons of color have long suffered the placement of heavily polluting power plants and factories near their homes. But all of us are now being affected by the changes in weather patterns, including intensified storms, droughts, and fires. I am also deeply concerned about the distribution of wealth in our society and the failure to adequately provide health care, housing, and food security to millions of workers and millions more unable to work due to mental and physical limitations. Wealth and class distinctions seem far more of a danger now than ever previously. So in amidst all these concerns about our society, is it really productive to blame and exclude old white males and some white females, most of whom have good intentions from UUism on the basis of a questionable analysis of power and control? Too often our society seems to choose to see the world in terms of a zero-sum game in which there are only winners and losers. Why can't we see that we all can be winners by working together? Why can't we take the best from capitalism and the best from socialism, more like the many democratic socialist nations of the world? In our movement, why do we need to remove one group in order to raise up another group? Can't we all work together to shape a better UUism and a better world? I've long believed in a version of the perennial philosophy which teaches that there are many paths up the mountain of truth and wisdom. We do not need to block off and abandon any path. We do need to recognize the many paths, the many understandings of reality, the many opportunities for working together. Blacks and other persons of color will have a harder time to shape a successful UUism and United States without the support and collaboration of white allies. Whites in this movement may have much to learn about the ways persons of color have been wounded and excluded, but this movement has much potential good to offer. So, where do we go from here? I'm working on that for next week. Shalom, salam, blessed be, namaste, and amen. Thank you. Um, we have a couple minutes. If anyone has comments or thoughts they'd like to make, I will bring down the microphone and ask you, encourage you to speak loudly and clearly. Anyone?
Yeah. I, I have a question about where we can see this document that you're referring to the report. Uh, there's one in the office. There's, there's a copy that's available that can circulate. Would we publish in that magazine? Uh, no, it wasn't published in there. Some of the recommendations have been, but um, I can. I think I still have a PDF of the document that I can send. If anyone's interested, send me an email and I'll uh, I'll, I'll uh, send that. Out. Okay, now I should explain the hymns a little bit. I know I've used the, what, the first hymn before, Rank by Rank. Um, that hymn used to be sung at General Assembly in the service of living tradition each year. I don't think it was used either last year or this year, and I kind of feel that as a loss because it expresses some things about particularly about ministry. And the service of living tradition is where ministers and religious educators um, are recognized um, both in the beginning and the end of their service. And so it has some heart feeling to me over the years as I've recognized people who have finished their period of leadership and possibly died. Um, but it also speaks about the beginning of service uh, to this movement. The other song that we're going to sing, Gather the Spirit, you probably will recognize a little more easily. And if you look at the, uh, if we didn't cut it off, yeah, his name is there. You uh, might recognize that we've had Jim Scott here a number of times. This is his song. It's among you, you use his best known song, but it really speaks to possibilities, I think. I invite you to, to uh, turn to gather the spirit and join me in singing.
invite you to make a circle, and if you are comfortable, join hands. If not, you know, elbows are good too. We're symbolically joining is equally acceptable at this point. May this congregation always be dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences, beneath all our diversity, there's a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together. In spite of time and death and the space between the stars, we pause in silent witness to that unity. May the stars carry your sadness away. May the flowers fill your heart with beauty. May hope forever wipe away your tears. And above all, may love make you strong. Go out in love, go out in peace. Amen.